So let's get started. So welcome to Endless Possibilities using its green screen. My name is Sherry Murray and I am the Saga Arts Council's Communications Manager. This webinar is part of our TD Culture Lab webinar series, which is professional development uh, webinar series presented by Mississauga Arts Council and sponsored by TD Bank Group. The Mississauga Arts Council is dedicated to enabling the growth of the arts by curating opportunity and connection between artists and residents in Mississauga and beyond. Now in our 42nd year, the Mississauga Arts Council is a registered charity um, dedicated to our vision of Mississauga as a vibrant cultural community where arts and culture thrive. And the Mississauga Arts Council acknowledges the land on which we gather is part of the treaty and traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron Wendat and Y and Dot Nations. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land and give our respect to these people and their ancestors who have been inhabitants and caretaker of this land since time immemorial. We also recognize that Mississauga is now home to many global indigenous peoples. So before I introduce my presenter, I want to take this opportunity to talk a little bit more about Mac Studio and all of the incredible opportunities it provides for our Mac members. So hold a second, I'm gonna pull this up. Okay, so a little bit about Mac Studio. So Mac Studio has recently opened up in September of 2022. It is available for all Mac members. And uh, as long as you're a Mac member, it's free to use. Um, and you can create all types of digital content in this space. And I'm gonna get into a little bit of what you can create and how you book the space and guidelines and things like that. So it's a studio space located in our office, which is located at 300 City Center Drive. Suite 1055, Mississauga and City Hall. So as I said, it's open to Mac members, staff and board, and it is a space for the creation of a variety of multimedia content. So members are encouraged to use this space to create content such as films, social media videos, artist introduction videos, um, regular interviews, one-on-one, -on -one, music videos, photography, images of artwork, headshots, and lots more. The possibilities are really endless. So Mac Studio is available to be booked during Mac's in-person office hours on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays from 10 a.m. to 4 o'clock p.m. Um, reason for that is that is way uh, uh, staff can be on site to help uh, get you read, get you settled into the studio, help set up equipment for you, um, and it is not available to be booked after those hours unless a specific request is made. But inquiries um, on hours after booking are not always guaranteed. Um, you can always send an email to studio at missagartscouncil.com if you have any questions regarding that. So the studio guidelines. So we recommend before you book a time slot, um, please review the studio guidelines, which are located at MissagaArtsCouncil.com slash Mac-Studio slash. So all the information about the studio, including um, what guidelines are included, uh, a little bit about the space, list of equipment, um, and regarding all that kind of stuff is available. Um, but to talk a little bit more of the studio space. So uh, there's a couple of things to keep in mind. Uh, you can book the studio for up to four hours at a time. That is just because it allows for other artists to book out the space. Um, Mac staff will come in and get you settled in the studio, show you around the equipment, set up the equipment, but they will not do uh, videography for you. They won't film you or do photography for that. We're here to assist you to do that. But if you're looking for a videographer or an editor, we could always um, shoot us an email uh, and we can help you get set up with somebody in our community that could do that for you at the studio. Okay, so how to book, that is also on the same web page. So MissaArtsCouncil.com slash Mac-Studio. Um, so a request for a time slot will be reviewed and then confirmed. Um, please note though that your booking is not complete until you receive a confirmation email from studio at MissaArtsCouncil.com. Um, and um, yeah, so thank you all so much. Um, as I mentioned before, please go onto the website for the full list of equipment, what kind of backdrops we have available. And we really hope to see you use this space um, and 
please, if you're not already, sign up as a MAC member in order to gain access. And now I'll hand it over to Chris. Thank you very much, Sherry, for the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for attending tonight. Uh, it's so glad uh, to, to see all of you here and uh, to see so much interest in filmmaking and specifically taking advantage of the new Mac Studio. I think uh, the opportunity that you have available to you as a Mac member is so unique that you can book your own studio space for free uh, and make use of this technology that's available to you again for free. So it's pretty cool. Uh, I've worked at various studios and locations in the past uh, where you'd be charged for this space. And I think take this opportunity as much as possible to start thinking of content you want to create, whether it's professionally, if you want to, let's say, uh, introduce your brand new book or a work of art you've created, or uh, even play around with it do personal things and create you know greeting greeting videos for your family and friends it's a great space to get acquainted with because it's low pressure it's very welcoming and uh, i'm here today to tell you some basics about green screen technology and how you can use it in the mac studio now show of hands uh, whether uh, on screen or in the chat uh, has anyone used green screen technology before now some of you absolutely have yeah and so today's tutorial today's webinar will be a little bit about the very basics of it and how uh, the space is utilized and also uh, the technology or the editing software that you can use so i'm going to try and dissolve it down to the most basic uh, way possible to make it easier and more accessible for as an entry point now for some of you uh, you might have had some experience already in the past and i think for a lot of us especially over the course of uh, the past couple of years with video communications and technology, uh, you might not be aware, but you've used something similar to green screens even here on Zoom. So if you wanna give it a shot, if you see your picture here in the, the Zoom uh, platform and you uh, right click your image and choose virtual background, uh, you can submit or uh, replace out your background here. And this is something called the compositing or replacing the background in a very similar kind of way that you might see uh, in today's tutorial. So in this case, I'm out in space. So let's go into the presentation itself. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, pop them into the chat. Uh, Sherry and I will do our best to, uh, to address and answer them as we go on. But I'll also have some opportunities for, for all of us folks here to, uh, to ask questions at the end as well, okay? Uh, so today will be just a little introduction. I'm going to go into the history of green screens, just a, a really quick way, and then into some more practical elements and look into how software can be used for it. Uh, now, introduction a bit to myself. Um, I served on the Mississauga Arts Council as a digital navigator, but in the past, uh, I've been a digital coast, a coach. So for folks learning how to use different kinds of technology, social media apps, uh, cameras, film, photography, and bring it in a way that makes you feel a bit more encouraged to try playing around with it and not feeling overwhelmed and hoping that today my webinar can do the same. Uh, and nowadays I work with the Walt Disney Company and uh, recently trained as a summer at the Walt Disney Studios. So uh, I have a kind of a, an overarching idea over the past 100 years of Disney film. I hope I can bring a little bit of that into uh, your experience today as well. So let's get into it if you are ready. And of course, this is going to be recorded to be viewed later on, just in case. So let's head into our presentation here. Video basics using a green screen. And hopefully everyone can see this here. All right, looks good. So let's move on. All right, using a green screen. Now, from the looks of it, uh, maybe one or two of you have used this before or have been familiar with it. Uh, a lot of us, uh, maybe unknowingly, are very familiar with green screens and don't realize they're all around us. But let's go into the first part of it. A green screen might typically look like this. Now, in some cases, this is a full studio where it's all the way around. In the Mac Studio space, it's uh, on a single wall. Uh, but it is quite big. You'll find that you're going to need a green screen to be pretty large. Uh, so you have a good enough area to light and be behind you, especially if you're trying to isolate or remove a background. So the, the beauty of having a studio space to work in like this, or like the Mac Studio, is that you avoid having the things, let's say, in the background of your home that you don't want folks seeing if you want to record a video or uh, explain something or make become a vlogger and re make reviews of different works of art that you want to or talk about your kinds of art. This way you have a nice clean background and with a green screen, perhaps a different kind of background. 
So what is it? So a green screen, not just a screen that is green, but it's a backdrop. It's used in VFX or visual effects. It allows folks that create films uh, to replace the background. Uh, it's a process called compositing or layering with an image that they want to. And the way they do this is they isolate that specific color, that hue uh, or chroma range, and you can make this transparent uh, via a process called keying. So these are some words you want to be familiar with. You might see in the technology or the software that you may use. Uh, chroma keying, keying, compositing. And that's all in place with a green screen. Now, it's a vocabulary to be aware of. Chroma key, root words, Greek, chroma, color. So the key when you see anything about chroma is it's all to do with the color that you're removing or targeting when you're isolating it in shots. And compositing. So compositing, uh, you might be familiar with terms if you are interested in a bit of film, things like mats or uh, layers. And you'd composite or place these layers on top of each other. So uh, it's been in use throughout the decades in film. And even Walt Disney himself, his very first films uh, were a series of Alice shorts where he would composite uh, a real human subject, the Alice character, with animated characters and put them together on screen. This at the time, very revolutionary, but nowadays very common. And compositing is used to, let's say, create environments or shots that might be either impossible or very expensive. So key points, let's say Titanic avatar to use a Canadian director as example. Now you might be wondering why the color green? So does anyone have any ideas why a green screen is necessarily green? I think the first time I was introduced to this, that was my number one question. Why, why not any other colors? Ah, good point. So Karen says it's the opposite of skin tones. And yes, to be fair, uh, not all of us are Kermit green. Uh, and like Elizabeth says, type of green isn't usually used in costumes, skin and backgrounds or backdrops. And yes, all of it, very good answers. Uh, and yep, that's true. So this is me in a green screen suit uh, when I work over at the Toronto International Film Festival. We had what was called the digital play space and uh, we would use this to make ourselves invisible or key ourselves out. Uh, but excellent answers. So why green? It is the furthest for most skin tones. So there's a less likelihood that it will be filtered out or canceled out in your shots. So if you're keying, uh, chroma keying the color green, uh, there's a lower likelihood for us humans uh, that our skin would pick up a green tone and render us less visible in the shot. Secondly, uh, like was noted, clothing. So not too many folks wear bright green unless you're specifically targeting that color to be invisible in a shot. Uh, so you find a lot of performers, a lot of uh, behind the scenes folks actually wearing these colors so they won't be seen or the heads popping up on screen. We'll get into that into a little bit. Uh, and lastly, uh, Sometimes backgrounds, yes, rarely have that color, but you run into issues if, let's say, you're shooting outdoors and also having a green screen set up because you might pick up those colors in the background or shots. If you have a natural green space like nature, trees, grass, you might want to look at other colors or other uh, tones. And I'll also touch into that into a little bit. But nowadays, a lot of editing software that you might be introduced to or you might become familiar with um, have greater sensitivity or uh, sensitivity or more attuned to the color green because it is so ubiquitous and commonly used uh, that the result is technically a lot cleaner and a lot easier to work with. So uh, keep it nice and simple, stick with green. And that's what we've got in the Mac Studio. And that's why green is uh, so, so commonly used across the industry. You'll see here that green is not necessarily the only color that can be used. So you see the color orange in bed knobs and broomsticks. In fact, in the original Mary Poppins, uh, there was a what was called a sodium vapor screen or yellow screen, so not green at all. Uh, and they were actually shot against a white background. And you'll find that for more modern film techniques, uh, you'll see this in blue. So uh, in the most recent superhero films you might be aware of, uh, blue is most often used, and 
there are a couple of reasons for this, not just uh, from what I noted before with certain backdrops, like necessitating um, green elements that need to be in there that would be difficult to chroma key out. Uh, blue is often used if the subject or the characters, let's say in the scene, are closer to the backdrop or closer to certain elements. Uh, you'll find that with a green screen or green backdrop, it's got a higher luminance. And what this refers to is it's it's it can cast a lot more light back at whatever it is in front of it. And when that greenness starts to go around or bleed onto the subject in front, uh, you might have fuzzier outlines or you might have unwanted elements that will be more difficult for the visual effects team to key out. So blue is often used in this case, especially for high intensity action scenes where there are things coming close to their characters and they find it to be a lot simpler nowadays. Uh, so green's not the only option, but it's the most common for sure. Now, where is it used? Where have you seen? I mean, you've seen a couple examples uh, that I've shown you so far in film, but where else do we think we've seen a green screen utilized before, maybe on a very regular daily basis? News. Excellent. So Freed says uh, on the news, absolutely. Uh, weather forecasters, you see this on TV, CP24, not, not necessarily to plug, but uh, you see this all the time. Uh, you might even see it again, yep, on Zoom. Uh, and anyone else? Well, let's go into it, because I think I, we've recovered the, most of the bases here. So where green screens can be used. So for sure, filmmaking. So it's since the 1930s, in fact, I think there's a very good example in the 1940s called The Thief of Baghdad, where uh, this kind of technology was used very well. Uh, but in fact, it might be a bit older than that. So they used prior to green screens, black backdrops. And the Max CEO, again, a black backdrop is available. And the reason for this is that it was easier for them to cut around the subject. And of course, if you're in a very static location, standing very still, it's easier for them to trim around you and put them against another image, also in black. So putting you against a black backdrop, putting you out in space, uh, also the reason why it's easier to Photoshop, let's say some folks against a darker or black backdrop, because it's just an easier way to outline. But uh, since then, technology has improved and it has continued to grow. And you see green screens or green items or green props being used, uh, not just to change the backdrop, but also to change what's in the foreground. So things that you want to remove or replace. Ah, and puppeteering. So uh, I also work for CBC just uh, on occasion in their puppet studio uh, for CBC Kids. And of course, uh, for a lot of puppeteering, you'll find that you don't notice these folks are behind the scenes or literally under the scenes, but you'll, you'll notice that puppets, especially what are called rod puppets, that need to be able to interact with each other, with the other folks in the scene and also with props, and they need to move. So they're not just, uh, uh, you know, hanging from uh, marionette strings. And these are often uh, wrapped around with green tape and these are keyed out. So uh, similarly, if you want to do something and have some fun in the Max Studio space, you can even bring in your own puppets. Now we've got a fantastic puppet festival happening in Mississauga right now. Uh, and a great way to try and look at, you know, ways that puppeteering can be or have been improved with the use of green screens, especially for television nowadays. So you see these folks here all dressed in green, and it's a good way to make sure that you don't have any unwanted heads popping up on screen. And of course, television. So since the 70s, it became more and more common to find meteorologists standing in front of a screen uh, where they, of course, uh, may encounter some issues if the clothing they're wearing uh, has the same kind of hues. Uh, so uh, it is something you see every day. And so folks, uh, even kids nowadays, once they see a green backdrop, a lot of them, uh, like my experiences at the Toronto National Film Festival, uh, they know instantly uh, what this is for and what it can do. Uh, and uh, I think it's, especially if you're doing it live with a live uh, feed, uh, it's fun to sort of see what's behind you and uh, play around with it. So in this case, with my backdrop, I can play with the stars on my Zoom screen. Now, here's just an example from my work. And you see, again, like I mentioned, kids 
absolutely love it. And it's not just for kids. I mean, for folks of all ages, uh, you know, whether professionally, if you do it, taking it very seriously, if you're uh, an avid filmmaker or just beginning, I think the best way to learn is to play around first, uh, see what works, see what kinds of elements, you know, uh, can be easily uh, removed from screen or made invisible and if, as ways to inspire you, you know, if you want to, let's say, launch a new product, if you're a, a crafter and you like uh, the idea of having the items that you create show up on screen and be able to rotate, but don't necessarily want to show your hands in the shot, consider, hey, you know what, what about green gloves? Will that work? What, what about a green suit? Uh, what if I just paint an, uh, a support system green and have it appear uh, floating against a backdrop just in white? Uh, things to consider. So there's a lot of possibilities. Like again, the name of this webinar, Endless Possibilities. With a green screen, you can literally put anything you want back there. So uh, here's a quick tutorial that I created for uh, Mac. An introduction to green screen. Uh, some of you may have seen it, but uh, just in case you haven't, I'm going to go and... Uh, share it with you now. Before that, uh, do we have any questions? Um, just on the introduction to what green screens are or the history. And again, you can also save them for the end, just in case. Okay. So uh, for those of you that may be listening on headphones, uh, just be aware, uh, uh, there could be some volume with this next one and some music. It is going to be a video. So uh, adjust your volume accordingly. Yes, Sherry Murray. It looks like Emily is, has her hand up. Uh, if she wants to ask a question, go ahead, Emily. Go for it. Yeah, thank you. I was just wondering if green screens are ever used in like regular, um, not animated films, like besides like Mary Poppins type, like a regular situation, you know what I mean? Yes. Uh, yes, live action films quite a bit. So uh, you'll find that even for the most basic things, let's say they're filming on a street in, in Streetsville, uh, and there might be branding for a sign like a, a favorite shawarma place that they don't have the rights to. Uh, they'll put green, uh, green paper, which is also available in the Mac Studio, over top certain elements and then composite them out or put something on top of it. So it's used very frequently, uh, let's say on things like license plates, uh, on signage, uh, anything that you either want to put in or take out. So uh, you'd be surprised how often the uh, the green color can be used. And you'll notice sometimes when it is being used, uh, when you notice the absence of green uh, elsewhere on, on the scene, because they just easier to take out. Good question. Uh, so it's not necessarily just for, you know, big sci-fi blockbusters or uh, cartoons. It's uh, It's pretty common. And feel free to keep these questions coming, folks. If you have if you have them, just uh, let Sherry or myself know. But again, uh, be aware of your volume, just in case you've got headphones on. Uh, you can turn it down and turn it up if you need to. But I'm going to be sharing for you uh, a new uh, a new uh, tutorial that I shared. Actually, before that, Farid asks, "Can we mix colors? Can we add out something with a blue screen? The character has a green blanket covering her." Uh, yes, typically for chroma keying. Uh, it is just a singular color or anything in that family. So uh, it can be, you can expand the range of greens, so lighter or darker greens. Uh, but uh, let's say uh, you don't, for example, if the main color is green, you want to avoid anything else in that hue, in that chroma range. Uh, but you can't have, you can't have something blue in that. It doesn't necessarily mean you can, you have to eliminate all greens or all blues, if that's your question. <laughs> uh, all right, let's head into this tutorial. This tutorial is brought to you by the Mississauga Arts Council. Here at the Mac Studio, you can take advantage of a very special tool that allows you to change the environment that you're filming in. This is called a green screen. Now this allows you to key in or replace the backdrop to better illustrate the particular subject or topic you might be talking about. Make good use of the green screen to unlock the possibilities for music videos, explainers, or any kind of content you want to create. Now, there are a couple of key tips and tricks to use a green screen very effectively, especially in the Mac Studio space. Step one, make sure that the green screen backdrop is as consistently lit and as even as possible. A good green screen is smooth and straight. You don't want to see any folds. So don't be afraid to use a little steamer 
to even it out. Using the camera settings for aperture and exposure can drastically change the way the green screen will appear on screen. The best way to ensure a consistent look for your green screen is by lighting it separately. Using two different lights at equal distances will ensure that you have a very consistent look and it will allow for easier keying, which is the process to digitally recreate or replace the backdrop. Now you'll notice the green screen is green. So you'll want to avoid that particular color or that tone, unless you want something to appear invisible. One thing to keep in mind with green screens is you don't want to have what's called green or your lights casting a green tint or hue on the subject in front of you. This can lead to some fuzzy outlines or at worst, blending into the background, which you don't want. You can counteract this by using backlights to create depth and separate the subject from the green screen itself. Now, some situations might require the light to be in frame or on camera, but don't worry, you can always crop it down. Another trick is placing your backlight directly behind you, as long as you don't move around too much. Now, sometimes your creativity might require a wider shot showing your whole body, depending on what you want to do with a green screen and have fun with. You might be seeing a bit more of the studio than you'd like, and this is where cropping comes into play. You can always crop or trim down the frame in whatever video editing software you have, so you don't catch all the things behind the scenes. I think the best way to learn is by doing. So book your Mac Studio space, come on in, and have fun with it. The green screen is here for you. Mac members, create your own digital content in Mac's new studio space. Review the studio guidelines and book your slot by visiting mississaugartscouncil.com. All right. Thank you, everyone. So. Let's go back into it now. Uh, that was a nice brief look at how the studio space can be used and the technology. I'll be going a bit more in depth about editing or using Chroma keys yourself. And it is pretty simple and I'll try and make it even simpler as I go. So we're gonna move on. So like I mentioned uh, in that little tutorial there about lighting or uh, how to use the space, uh, this is a pretty general guideline that you want to have very even lighting on the green screen when you're in there. Uh, the reason why is if you have a side of the green screen that is more in shadow and a side that's more in light, uh, for editing software, when you're using chroma keying, it'll identify them as two different hues you know, or two different, uh, two different ranges of light and dark green and might make it more difficult. You'll have to do more adjustments in order to make it work for the background. So the more even the backdrop is, the better. You'll notice here the subject in this shot is uh, four feet away from the back screen. Uh, and generally rule of thumb, you wanna be a bit closer to the camera and further away from the backdrop just so you don't have that, uh, because like I mentioned earlier, green has a high luminance. So you don't want having that the green cast onto you and have you sort of begin melting into the backdrop. Here's another way of looking at it right here. So you've got the camera here at the bottom. Uh, you've got the lights. And here, uh, if you remember what I mentioned in that really quick tutorial video about uh, having a backlight, it's key because those shadows uh, may cast onto the back screen. You want to eliminate that as much as possible because if you see shadows showing up in the backdrop, uh, and let's say the backdrop is supposed to be uh, somewhere else, let's say outdoors, uh, that kind of doesn't, it removes how easy you sell that you're somewhere else. So it's uh, it kind of takes you out of that illusion. It breaks the look. Uh, so you want to eliminate the, the shadows as much as possible. Uh, but uh, the key is if you are, let's say, using a pre-selected uh, video as your backdrop or something that you like, uh, you want to try and match that same lighting as much as possible. All right. So are you ready to practice? Well, let's have a look here at the chat just in case. Uh, no, we're looking very good so far. So feel free to... Uh, have a look here. I'm going to take you into my editing software. I'll show you some options that we have uh, uh, that I might recommend. I use Adobe Premiere. It is subscription based, so it is a bit on the pricier side. And if you're a bit more uh, you know, serious about it, uh, I know some folks can get it for between ten to twenty dollars monthly. So it's uh, quite the investment. Uh, you can have Final Cut Pro if you are, let's say, an Apple user. Again, pretty pricey, three hundred dollars. Or there's some free software out there like DaVinci Resolve, even Windows Movie Maker, uh, things that you can very easily uh, 
get your hands on that might not be as expensive or especially for a first time investment. And uh, I think as far as using the technology in the Mac Studio, uh, you want to go as easy as possible if you're just playing around or just do a couple trials, try some trials. Okay, so let's go and uh, I'm going to share you my my workspace right now. There we go. So let's go in with a very, very basic way of uh, taking one of my clips, something that I filmed right inside the Mac Studio space, and how I can use the green screen and key that out or use compositing to replace the back shot. Let's head on in. So welcome, welcome into my Premiere space. You'll see here that I've got some clips ready that I've already put in there. I also have, uh, just to give you a basic idea, it might look overwhelming for those of you that don't, I uh, use video editing for software very often. Uh, this here is what's called a timeline. So I'm just going to get my video here. I'm going to take it. I'm going to drag it in. All right. When you see here, uh, it tells me how long, how many seconds I've got of this footage. It's got me looking great on screen. Uh, and my timeline here is populated with what I want. Now you notice all of a sudden things have started to happen. You've got effect controls here, uh, which I wouldn't recommend you uh, messing with to start. Uh, for the purposes of this uh, tutorial, I'm going to uh, not use too much of this, but generally this is just the uh, the size, let's say, of how, how this might appear on screen and where it is. But I'm relatively just going to leave it where it is for now. Now. Uh, for today's webinar, we're talking about keying or green screen. And you'll see here in the Mac state space, uh, the green screen is there. Uh, it's been nicely smoothed out and laid out. Again, if you do see some folds like you might on screen around me, uh, this can be, if it's not too harshly affected by any shadows, can still be effectively uh, uh, removed. So I will get here on the effect side. You've got a lot of things uh, under video effects. And the one we're looking for, remember those keywords that I introduced you to at the beginning? We're looking for keying. Yeah. And you might see some of them over here. So color key is another way of saying chroma key. You've got different kinds of keys. Uh, and I'll show you the differences between a more uh, basic one and a more advanced one, OK? So here's color key. And in my, my platform here, Adobe Premiere, I'm just going to drag it onto the clip. I'm going to let go. All right. And you see here on the left-hand side, color key shows up under my effect controls. Now, this color key lets me choose what I want to isolate in my shot. And you'll see here, uh, the default color is blue. So let's go grab this dropper. And let me suck up where I want to uh, have it. Technically, you want to get it as close to the subject as possible. So there. And you see here, it's identified this very particular U of green around here. And that's not just what we want. We want it to have a bit more. So for this color key is something called color tolerance, which is the sensitivity. And lets me amp it up to see how much more green I can take. And you see here, as I slowly do it, it's grabbing more and more of that green. But what else do you notice? On my clothing here, because I am very close to the floor, that green is casting just a little bit on me. And that would mean that I and parts of my clothing would also be filtered out if I use this in the shot. So maybe not the best example here. But let's have a look and see if I can do anything else with color keying. So edge thin allows you to refine the edges a little bit more. If let's see, you still got a little green outline around the subject. Keep in mind, this does affect hair. And edge feather softens that out a bit. And again, it might result in uh, a more refined look, but also maybe a bit softer and fuzzier, so less realistic. So let's see what this might look like with the current parameters on a basic color key, knowing, of course, that this, uh, this range here um, doesn't take into account this bottom part that is bled onto the bottom of my pants and the top. So 
what will I do? I'm going to want to take this backdrop that is now black and put something underneath it. So I'm going to go import uh, some footage that I've got. So let's see what I've got here. OK, so let's pop in a nice backdrop. Perhaps uh, I want to be sitting. Uh, OK, drop this in in the mall, okay? And you might not recognize this as uh, square one, yeah? So I'm gonna pop this over here and bring it underneath myself. Oop. And you see here, so we might have uh, myself showing up, yep, directly in square one. And you see here, not the best example, but let's uh, choose a different kind of clip with some more even lighting. And perhaps use ultra key as a as a way to remove some of these artifacts you might see on screen. So, but a nice basic look at how, let's say, you have a backdrop and your subject and the keying works. Let's go in with another example then instead. So in this case, I'm gonna go and choose my backdrop first for my video screen. So take this and bring it in here. I've got myself a nice, delightful meadow. Yeah. Oh, let's make sure that works. Looking good. All right. And then I'm going to go and pull myself in from another shot. So let's say me standing up over here. Now I'm going to go and let's say I want to just trim a certain part of this. So I want to take just from about here until just about there. Now things you might want to recognize, uh, for a lot of editing software, it's the same across the board. Uh, when you want to start a shot, uh, that's called the in point, or I. And when we want to end the shot, that's the out point, or O. So I'm going to press I here, grab where I want to begin, Ooh, and out, take her out. And I'm just going to drag this right into my timeline as well. So like before, you see me there. In this case, I'm going to use a different tool this time different keying tool. Instead of color key here on the right-hand side, I'm going to go all the way down to ultra key, which might be a bit better. It's got a lot more uh, a lot more tools attached to it that'll make it more sensitive and uh, be a bit more discriminating in the kinds of greens that you want to pull. So I'm just going to take that. I'm going to drag it on top. I'll head to my effect controls now, and you see I've got ultra key here. You've got the output here for composite. And we've got the key color default set to black, but now I'm going to grab that green near me. Grabbed it. So you see here automatically it does a better job of isolating or taking out uh, what I don't want to see. But for now, I'm just going to go and pull that background video away so you can see it better. You see here that I've gone and I uh, removed all that green around me, even the parts that might have had a little bit of bleed down below. Now you'll find as well with this. Uh, you've got some more tools, so a bit more refined than the other tool, the other color key. Uh, so for to clean up the mat, which is the layer that I now am. So for example, uh, here's a good idea to look at it. Instead of looking at the composite view, let's look at the alpha channel view. So you can see just the parts that have been removed. You'll see there are some parts that might not have been as cleanly removed because of shadows on there. And you can go and you can just change, let's say, the highlight, so that might show up a bit more, and you might want to reduce that as much as possible. Some of the shadows might show up more. You might want to reduce that as much as possible. And you see a nice cleaner or more flat back there. Let's have a look at that in the composite view to see how that affects it, OK? So like I just did, I went and changed the highlights, and I changed the shadows. And you see, if you have that there, and if I put my backdrop back in underneath it, those parts don't look quite as clean or quite as good. And again, you see how just by using these tools here, these little refinements for, let's say, the lighter spots or the darker spots, make it look a bit more realistic or believable. And the key is tuning it in to find a spot that looks a bit better. I'll take out that video again so we can see where I am. And that looks a bit more even from our viewpoint here. 
but you've also got that little rim that layer just around me an outline that we don't want to see so let's go in there as well now you've also got the tolerance which is similar to the uh, the sensitivity with the other the other tool there and dragging it back and forth it looks like it does a pretty good job but there's something more we can do so we've got the mat cleanup so the mat again being the layer uh, in film it's uh what I am in this case I'm being layered on uh, to the backdrop and the choke here uh, if you can see on your screen you see how I'm reducing that little outline around me right now it's kind of going away and as it goes away I look a bit crisper a bit more uh find in the space and let's check that out with the video behind it again yeah looking pretty good now there is another way of course you see outline no outline instead of having to drag the video in and out you see the little eyes here on the timeline down below you just close that eye by poking it ouch and it's gone yeah it's an easy way instead of having to drag it in and out there for you cool and again, uh, the similar sort of dials here, you can soften the outline there. You see how it kind of soft, if it go too far, it almost softens my outline completely. We don't want that too much. Contrasting the elements in the background. So if let's say that highlight there, you see that disappear. Yeah, and of course the midtones. Yeah, so we don't want to have too much disappear. We want to keep things in the shot. And we want to work with it to make it look as good as possible. Now, like in that little tutorial I showed you earlier, we also have, of course, a lot of stuff in the frame. And again, you know, you don't want to see all of the gear. And in film or television, they do a very good job of taking that out. So there's a couple of ways we can do this. Uh, let's say for starters, I might change uh, the scale or the size of myself in there. So I might make myself bigger. Yeah. I might remove some things just by shifting the shot a little bit. And I might also, what did I say? Well, cropping. So type in the word crop, find the crop tool, drag it on top here, crop. And you'll see here, we've got the crop percentages for the different size that I want to go in. So from the left, I'm doing this by dragging using my mouse. You can also, if you are a bit more refined and you want to have the same look in all of your shots, go on in and type in the number and see if that works for you. Going in from the right and going in from the bottom. Well, it's out of the shot. So you'll see if we go too far, erasing entirely, but not bad. That looks pretty good with me out there in the shot. You'll see I might have cropped it too much on that side, but a good way of seeing me show up in there. Now, again, some limitations of cropping, of course, if uh, you do find yourself uh, going a bit too far, you don't want to chop off your body. Yeah, not too bad. A nice, easy peasy way of looking at uh, using compositing to put yourself into a green screen shot also with some cropping there to make sure you remove some of the elements for a more full body look not too shabby now sorry from there let's have a look and see any questions so far about that let's see yeah yeah so we have a few questions so uh the first one is do you have any tips if you don't have adobe premiere yeah, so if you don't have Premiere, uh, you can. There's a lot of good tutorials out there with uh, on YouTube. So if you want to have uh, more free software like uh, Movie Maker or uh, DaVinci Resolve, that said, they might have it might a bit more involved. So it might take a few more steps than what I'm showing you. Premiere tends to be the easiest, uh, especially if you just go for like a free trial, just try it out. Uh, but those are some of the free ones. Uh, Final Cut Pro again, expensive, but uh, the you might find um, a tool called avid might be good it's uh, used a bit more professionally uh, but definitely play around with the uh, with the less expensive or the free ones first uh, just to get your your feet wet uh, that said 
Uh, would I recommend for some of the freer software because they aren't as sensitive as the ones that you pay for and subscribe to? You're going to want to make these settings that you have in the space as easy to work with as possible. So the less amount of dialing in that you need to do in the software afterwards, the easier and better it'll be for you afterwards. So if you can get that clean lighting, if you want to make sure that you're not uh, getting any bleed, have things as simple as possible to start with. So before you go uh, too ambitious with, let's say, having your full body show up or doing too much action and moving around in the space, uh, start off with something that's pretty straightforward, simple, uh, just your, you know, three quarter face, let's say a talking head, like a newscaster, uh, and that'll make it a lot easier. Talk closer to the camera, uh, use that movie maker, uh, and just download it even today and try playing around with it to try and uh, get accustomed or familiar with the idea of chroma keying or keying out. Uh, but those are the ones I'd recommend if you want to go in, uh, you know, entry level without needing to uh, uh, shell any big bucks for starters, if you're just trying to play around and test it out yourself. Yeah, so we have a couple other questions. So uh, that's great. Uh, if you're using a screen outdoors by grass, should you use a blue screen? Technically, yes. So uh, if you want to avoid having uh, that kind of associated bleed and uh, you know too much green out there in the shot, blue is good. Uh, that said, I think uh, for a lot of outdoor type shots, you would use the green screen, let's say, to remove an element as opposed to completely block out the background. Uh, and you know, I would recommend, that's why a lot of outdoor environments in film uh, or in TV are still filmed indoors. Uh, the green, mostly in outdoor shots, are just to, let's say, take that element and key it out completely. So you'd shoot that background separately. Let's say you're out in, uh, in a park there, Korea Park by a square one. Uh, you're just filming that backdrop for a while still without anything in front of it um, and then filming yourself and if there is something in that shot cover it in that color and then get rid of it great uh and then other question we have here is a question specifically of the comparison you did on the effect of lighting on mm -hmm. shadows so um they're asking do you recommend the lighting from the sides or from the front good question so let's uh Let's actually get another example of you, if I may. So let's go back into my editing software right now and go in. Excellent point. So let's grab in a uh, toil over here for lights. So this is another tutorial I did for uh, the Mac Studio, specifically for lighting. You'll see here uh, on screen that I've got myself uh, lit uh, 45 degree angles, and that's generally a good place to go. Uh, and because what this does is, uh, as I see here, I'm going to go through and scrub through my uh, my shot. One side will be the main one, nice and close to you. You'll see that as it goes on, there's shadows that show up on the other side. Going to want another light that gets rid of those shadows from the other side as you go through. So your filler light, so filling in all those darker elements here on the subject and of course that backlight behind you yeah so you see here uh not necessarily just from the side but uh 45 degrees either side is a pretty good place to go the key point of this is that you want to have yourself look nice and even so let's have a look and see how that even lighting might look uh when used in uh in video editing so trying to take out the background so again i'm going to go in and I for in, pull that clip, go a little bit here and take it out with O. And I'm going to drag that into my timeline. So take that, drag video only into the timeline. Here I am. I'm going to go and make myself uh, nice and big so you can all see there. Good. Now, over here, you see the lighting from both sides. Uh, there's some shadow out here, but otherwise fairly evenly lit. You might notice, ah, uh, Prince, you said you had to have a nice smooth background. And in this case, uh, the more most ideal you want to have your backdrop is pulled tightly. You might see some green screen backdrops uh, that are uh, pulled and stretched taut. Uh, and that will have a better result for you. Uh, so here, let's go back into what we normally do. We'll go and... 
We don't need to crop, but key. So we're going to use uh, that ultra key once more, drag it onto myself, bop, and take that key color here, click around me, and it takes it out. Pretty good. Now, if let's say, uh, you know, for for a lot of uh, a lot of cases, uh, with specifically for green screen or using a chroma key here, uh, if you are lit directly in front, so onto your face, uh, it shouldn't affect it too much, especially if you're far enough from the screen. Uh, the only drawback is that you'll have uh, harsher shadows, and uh, again, this could be a look you want to have if you want to have. Uh, I'm not doing anything. I just on my phone. I can't see these little things. <laughs> and again, you see here those folds in the background showing up. So let's clean that up by removing the highlights there. You see the shadows sort of outlining that. I'm going to go and change that out so it's more flat. Looking good. Tolerance is not bad. It's looking like I don't need to affect that too much. And again, choking. So the choke, uh, going in and removing that outline a little bit softening it just a tad around myself and let's choose another background now for uh what i recommend for a lot of you folks if let's say you know i where do i find these background these videos uh that i can use i can't just walk around town and film things uh, you can uh but you can also choose uh, a website that uh, has a royalty free video so i like to use uh, again, if we want to keep things, you know, not, not pay for it too much, uh, something called Pexels. So I'm going to go and find a background, let's say. Uh, uh, do you have any suggestions? Where do you want me to be? Anyone? Where shall I go? Shall I go to, uh, let's go to Toronto. All right, let's find some videos of Toronto in the background here. And what can I take? Well, it'll look nice and real-ish. I'm going to be uh, right here at C Toronto City Hall, let's say. Here we go, and it's going to download that. Great. Make sure you credit that folk person there for creating this great footage. And I'm going to go and import this into my project here. Good. Now, as I'm doing that, let's see if I got anything else. Okay, pulling this into my project now. Excellent. And going back in. So let's have a look here. Got the Toronto backdrop that I want to take. I'm going to go and drag that in underneath me. And I'm going to take that specific clip there change the scale or make it bigger so it shows up behind and not too bad bam here i am now if let's say i want to make myself look a bit more like i'm fitting into the backdrop so like i said earlier you'll want to try and match the way it looks as much as possible so i'll go and uh change the way i look in the scene i uh, can use different things like uh, uh you'll see on my screen here color correction so Lumetri color for Adobe folks. I can go and take that and just change lighting on myself. So I can look brighter or darker. So it looks more like I'm realistically in the scene where I am outdoors. Yeah. So like I'm more like in Toronto, right over there by City Hall. Yeah, not too bad. Yeah. Let's have a look at that. Compositing it in. Taking the backdrop. Yeah. Not too bad. Any other questions? Now, things that I want to uh, to show you folks as well is that you don't need to be uh, feel limited to let's say just doing uh, just doing yourself. If you don't want to appear on screen, you can do similar things with objects. So like uh, the puppeteering folks do, I uh, have stuff on there, use sticks uh, or use different supports to uh, suspend the item or whatever it is you want to show. Again, if it is a work of art, if it's a book, if it's uh, something you've created or something you want to show to folks on screen uh, and just 
have the green paper or green screen uh, fabric around it uh, to eliminate what's resting on. It could be pretty dramatic and look pretty cool. Now, I, what I recommend as well is, uh, you know, uh, again, play around it. So don't be afraid to uh, ask any of uh, your friendly video editors. They might have in local to you in uh, Mississauga, in the GTA. Uh, if you want to try playing with it yourself, uh, there are a lot of great resources out there online uh, and even on YouTube for techniques, but it's uh, really easy. It's something that a lot of folks, uh, you know, uh, even two, three decades ago, uh, didn't find as commonly accessible in their own homes. But now with the advent of uh, social media and content creation, especially if you want to get the word out for things, your own projects, and you want to have yourself show up in a backdrop that more adequately fits the message that you're trying to convey, uh, it's a good resource and it's a good thing that I think uh, uh, you want to take advantage of, especially because it is complimentary and included uh, as being a Mac member. Now, hopefully that explanation was uh, not too quick. I tried to dissolve it down as basic as I could, uh, but I can even show you just one more example, just in case uh, for your own personal reference. Let's have a look at one more shot, one more way to use this uh, uh, using another clip, okay? So let's go in, because I think the more you see it in action, the more familiarity you might get, especially when it comes to technology. So let's go in, let's grab another shot shall we? So let's try a more difficult one. You see me here sitting on the ground looking, uh, let's say the word is wistful. So again, I'm going to go into my clips. I'm going to select my in point with I, go on out with O, drag poor little prince onto the timeline. Here he is, Doo -doo -doo. looking great. So let's go over once more. What do I do next? I'm going to want to key out the background. So whatever software I'm looking for, let's look for keying or anything that has the word key associated. You've got a couple options to try out, but we'll try the strongest one, which is again, a ultra key here, dragging it in. Here you go. Go to my effect controls. It's in composite view. I'm going to go and grab the green color that I want. Grabbed it. I'm just going to double check and see in alpha channel what I've isolated or taken out. See what needs to maybe be corrected. Use my tools here for lighting and shadow to take out what I don't want to see. And you see here, it's a good way of looking at what does and doesn't get isolated. Mm -hmm. And again, you avoid having to do a lot of this by uh, eliminating some of these difficulties before, so it doesn't have to be edited too much in post. Let's have a look at how I look here. Choke out those outlines. Should I soften anything? No. Nope. Good. Not too much contrast needed there. Not too bad. It looks like I'm looking pretty good and i'm going to go import myself uh somewhere else so let's have a look let's go to mm -mm -mm. let's go to uh a nice little beachy scene okay scene here on screen a nice little beach or at least a tropical backdrop wishful thinking right now in this current climate <laughs> Go. I popped in there. Why it doesn't show up? Well, you'll see here. Remember, I turned it off. So I'm going to poke that eye again. Poke her open. And there I am. And let's uh, let's do a couple things here. It doesn't look quite as good. So let's make myself look a bit more real by putting me down into the space. And with the equipment or the gear that I see on screen, what do I want to do? Well, I'm going to want to crop it. So in this case, I can type in the word crop up top to make it easier. Crop and find it. Drag it onto my clip. Good. Take out what I don't want to see. So I want to still keep myself out there. Looks like everything else is pretty much out of the shot that I don't want. And uh, I'm going to move myself in the space. 
So let's place myself under that tree. Why not? Good. And I do stand out just a bit. So let's go and change a little bit of how I look there. Match that with the exposure. So the amount of light that's hitting me. Try and get those highlights up there with that sun back there. Shadow down the layout underneath the tree. And warm it up with the temperature as it is a tropical sort of look. And not too shabby. Let's see how I look in that space now. With like some compositing. Not too bad. Yeah, not too bad at all. <laughs> and again, it's all about having fun and uh, playing around with it as much as you can. Uh, and the more you work with it, the more that you uh, find inspiration, uh, the more you want to do and the more you can create. And I think uh, the best way I recommend all of you to first try out, try doing a very quick, simple, hi, everyone, I'm so-and-so, and I am currently here at this great location with the Aurora Borealis behind me, and work from there. Start off nice and simple and start expanding outwards, uh, showing more and more of your body, showing more different items, and playing with the green screen as much as you can. Great. So we have a question. Um, so uh, the question was, uh, I understand lighting from the front is better. If from the sides, should they not exceed 45 degrees? Technically, uh, for the green screen, uh, the more lighting, the better in a lot of cases. Uh, that way you stand out a bit more against the backdrop. Uh, but generally, you're going to want to keep the lighting 45 degrees from your subject out here. Just uh, so it's nice and evened out. You'll find uh, in a studio situation that you'll have a lot more lighting. So let's say from the sides, from the top on rigs, uh, from everywhere, from a lot of vantage points, just you want to make sure that if you do have something out more to the side, let's say, if you want to play around and have it beyond the 45 degree mark, make sure the other light is at equidistance, the exact same level, and so the exact same amount. You want to have these be as precise as possible. A lot of folks really use measuring tapes and find the distance just to make sure that it's a lot easier in post when you're trying to take out the background. So the more you do in prep ahead of time to make it as even keeled and balanced as possible. Uh, I mean, the 45 degrees is a good guideline. It's not a hard and fast rule. Uh, but again, if you have lots more lights, as long as it's nice and even, balanced out, you'll have a better experience in editing out the background later on. And that's what you'll find with a lot of productions, let's say, uh, nowadays uh, on television, film, streaming services, uh, that you'll have a lot more uh, expansive light situations. Uh, and they do count for that when they're, again, like I showed you in the, the last little uh, clip there, you're going to want to adjust that to make sure lighting looks real or really sells it in the end. Three reasons why green screens are great. Uh, one, you can make things you don't want to see invisible so supports objects or make things appear like they're floating uh two make your shooting location more versatile so you can choose what's behind you you don't have to stick with uh, what you might have at home you can use your studio space to be virtually anywhere the possibilities are endless and of course relatively quick and easy to use instead of uh you know requiring a lot of editing it nowadays it can be very very simple uh and uh, it's just a matter of playing around and seeing what works best. And again, doing the work just a little bit more, a little more work at the front end to make the uh, the post-production or the editing or software afterwards a bit easier. Uh, but that was the end. Thank you, Sherry. Yeah, thank you, Prince. That was wonderful. Um, we're going to be here for the next probably 10 or so minutes. So if you guys do have any questions, please put them in the chat here um, for Prince or me about the studio space and if you have any questions about it. Um, as we've been mentioning throughout this video, um, webinar is going to be recorded. So the video will be sent out to all of your emails to those who have registered. So you're more than welcome to look back through this and get all the tips and tricks that Prince showed. And um, yeah, thank you all for joining us. Um, feel free to add questions, but I do want to mention before anybody pops out um, that you guys are welcome to come back to our next webinar. Um, we're going to be having one next week about grant writing. Uh, same 
you know, on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. on Zoom. And we're also going to have some on public art and podcasting, and music copywriting. So all the information is on MixologArtsCouncil.com. Thank you both. And thank you, Prince, so much again for your wonderful webinar. Um, we invite you to come back to more TD Cultural webinars in the future. There's lots going on. So please check out our website and SagaArtsCouncil.com for more information. And we hope you all have a great night. Thanks for coming, everyone. Happy creating. <laughs>